Northeast and the Spark Project Collective. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is David is going to move things in the back because I bought this because they often store things on the stage and I felt like we were having a poetry reading in my laundry room. And actually, it was a lot better than a poetry reading in my laundry room. I would not trust my laundry room. My laundry room was not fit for human consumption, habitation, or consumption, actually. It does, however, create- Don't eat Tide Pods. Don't eat Tide Pods. No, Tide Pods are terrifying. Um, and David, is the mic on? Yes. Okay, I am not using the mic because I'm loud. Um, and ask them to choose to use the mic or not. Um, I, um, I am a advisor to Center of Anchorite, which is really David's project. Um, it is a chat book series. It is a full length with, it is a poetry, it's a movable beast, which is our every third Friday cabaret, which we welcome you to, we welcome to have you come and do something that you think you might fail at. Because I'm a believer that all failure can lead the only thing that makes art work is the willingness to fail continuously. You fail over and over again. But we're not here to talk about me and my ideas. Let me tell you, we are here to talk about, to celebrate Ash Hook and her new chapbook. The first time I heard Ash was actually at a movable beast when we were downtown. We had it in the um, we had it in solar culture. solar culture for a while. Before that, we were in somebody's back of somebody's uh, hair Salon. salon, and we had a like a garden and stuff um, so um, but we were not able to maintain that because money is hard um, so anyway so the first time I heard Ash was at solar culture she had come to the movable beast but I think somebody I think maybe David had seen heard her previously somewhere and invited her and I was just kind of blown away because um, you know I think it's really r r raw work it's important work um, it's upsetting work um, Ash was determined that she was a confessional poet, and I set her straight, damn it, because I believe she's a political poet. Um, and I think that her work is really important on a political level, on a personal level, um, and it really does a really good job of like displaying the realities of escaping Mormonism, violence in school, what it's like to be queer, and we're really lucky that she let us make her first chapbook, which I hope will be the first of many, many books and successes for Ash. So I'd like to introduce Ash Hook. Okay. You know, I, I've just got to get the crying over with, I imagine. So, um, Thank you, Mary Rose and David. David heard me at uh, Revolutionary Grounds, yeah, I think. Um, I have been writing poetry since I was 15 because that's where all female poets start writing poetry. When they're, well, no, that's not true, 13. That makes more sense. Um, trying to make sense of their life and what's happening to them. And I wrote a lot of bad teenage girl poetry. And um, to my mother's credit, she uh, knew I was writing poetry. She didn't understand it. She didn't want to know about it, but she bought me a journal to write it in. And I was grateful for that. And it became a, a one of many. And uh, I grew up in small town Utah. Um, small town Utah is worse than city Utah, just in terms of the kind of Mormon you are, um, the level of cultural oppression that comes from being Mormon in a small Utah town. And um, I am four gener fourth generation Mormon. My ancestors were directly tied to Joseph Smith. It's in my genetics. Um, and it never really felt right, but I didn't know how to articulate that except for what my therapist calls norm challenge theory, 
once in a while I would stand up and say, hey, I don't like this. And people shake their finger at me. And then every once in a while someone would come whisper in my ear, thank you for saying that. Um, and so in the process of writing all this poetry, nobody liked my poetry there. It scared them, made them question things. And I did what good Mormon girls do and got married at 19 and uh, had four children, which is a small family for Mormons. I had four children before I was 28 years old. Um, and I married a, not a very nice man. And I was with him for a long time. And then we moved to Tucson. And he started to lose control of me. And decided he would scare me a little by filing divorce papers. And in my, the thick of an abused woman said, you know, I think I'm gonna let this happen. I feel like I should let this happen. So I did. And, and you know, they tell you that after you get through your divorce, it's possibly the best thing that ever happened to you, but you don't feel that when it's happening. And when I got divorced at 46 years old, my entire world was shattered. And what you have in an opportunity when your world is shattered is you get to rebuild it the way you want. And that's a really rare thing. And I embraced it. And I have been on this path of discovering who I really am and who I want to be. Um, I'm 52, almost 53 now. Or do, I don't math on the spot, and I don't do that with two glasses of wine. So, like, what, seven years? Are we up to eight now? I don't know. Anyway, so I left the Mormon church um, not because my marriage failed and not because it's, like, crazy stuff but because of how they treated women. And the Women's March was that year, and I went and did the Women's March in Phoenix, and it, I was like, hey, wait, this isn't okay. And that started me on my path. Um, was able to acknowledge and embrace my queerness a couple years after that. And um, have been detangling the very tight woven loom of Mormonism in my life ever since, and it doesn't stop. Um, my best example from the, for that is I went to the Book of Mormon musical, and I cried through the whole thing because it's accurate. And I was like, it's hilarious, also accurate. So um, anyway, uh, I... I'm wearing this Captain Marvel jacket. I love Captain Marvel. I, today, when I went to a meeting with a bunch of teachers, and I teach um, high school, English, um, public educator. And when I went to a meeting this morning with a bunch of teachers, one of um, my friends, I had my Captain Marvel backpack and a different Captain Marvel jacket, different one. And see, that screw's gonna be. Anyway, um, and she said, does your backpack always match your jacket? And I'm like, well, anything Captain Marvel matches my whole self because it's an allegory of my life. And um, the man next to me says, were you adopted by the Cree? And I'm like, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's an oppressive religious structure. And he's like, okay, that tracks. <laughs> When I saw the first Captain Marvel movie, it was an allegory for my life, cried through that. Um, so I find meaning in allegory and poetry. I'm an English teacher in literature, all of that. And so I've been writing towards this book since I was 13. But it really coalesced, I would say, in the past couple years. Um, when I turned 50, I set a personal goal for myself to write 52 or 50 original poems and illustrate 50 original poems. And then on my 51st birthday, I had an open mic party and it was awesome. And, um, and then, that, so that got some practice in. And then I um, started doing open mics around town and I took 
and advanced poetry class at Pima and met Maggie and Michelle was in that class and and Maggie um, who read with me at the Movable Beast who was my teacher kind of helped me point me in a direction and things started to come up in terms of a chap a chapbook and it was really beautiful the way that was happening and then Mary Rose had David tapped me on the shoulder and said hey can we publish your work and I'm like really and they're like yeah really okay I just wore the jacket so that I could show it to you and talk about it now it's hot <laughs> okay so I can't express to you how amazing it is to have people want to hear what I have to say and see me for who I am. Because I've had people say, don't do that. Don't look that way. Don't sound like that for a really long time. Lay it on. Okay, the title is Surviving the Post-Mormon Apocalypse. Um, Mormons are doomsday preppers. My parents were doomsday preppers. They're, the, they're great doomsday preppers. I was a doomsday prepper. It's part of the, it's part of the um, dogma. The prophet tells you to plant a garden to preserve the food. We have two years worth of food storage. So that's why there's a mason jar on the front. I, uh, in my life, took care of a half acre garden and preserved at least 150 quarts of food a year. So, the allegory of an apocalypse of your world coming down, your world being destroyed, and then you living after that is also something that's important to me. Um, there are kind of three general areas of focus in my book, uh, teaching and queerness and and the apocalypse, right? And they all kind of layer together, um, untangling Mormonism. So I'm gonna read the first poem that helped me with deciding the title, which is called Living in the American Apocalyptic Genre, um, which starts us on this path of teaching and school violence and how people are tr um, trying to push queerness away from schools. The end of the world felt like every other school day. My perpetual teacher sadness distorting reality. Subliminal sorrow translated through a thousand clinically scared, depressed, medicated, anxious, hormonal youths as we wonder when the semi-automatic shoe will fall. Like atomic acid rain burning pinholes into copy paper boxes we'll use to capture selfies after the power runs out always unfazed, having drilled the almost useless emergency action plan since Columbine, when the Discord snare drum gunfire announced the end, we just thought we'd lost the 77-day lottery. Shambling to our designated spots, clustered fodder for the massacre. Any teachers left slip on coagulating flagstones, Dead kid, desensitization, tripping us up as we stumble through the newly fallen. Faces lost in the glint of gripped screen, shattered cell phones, apocalyptic cricket notifications, buzzing and chirping, forever unread. The jangling croaking is only the campus ravens, bathing in the blood pools, blooming in the courtyard before the cafeteria. I sit stroking the chestnut hair of a 16-year-old corpse whose name used to be Eli, but is now Crowmeat. I think he was in my honors English fifth period once. Seems I've failed him again. Well, me and the state and this American, American stratocracy that made anyone turn hollow rage into militia. Staring at the panoramic slaughter, dumbfounded in its useless grammar, tone deaf in the momentary shock of knowing that death literally means left behind, my sadness descends. 
For if the children are all dead, this really is the absolute end. Unless a blaze of sequins scorches my peripheral, and raising dry eyes, I spy rainbow banners snapping in the wind above an army of drag queens mounted atop fuming jet unicorns pawing at the gate, fierce manicures glinting, strapped with slung storybook bags and stolen AR-15s waiting to save us all. So there's a school shooting every 77 days. That's what that reference is. Um, a couple weeks ago, I came in um, after fall break to my classroom and it was dismantled. And all of my stuff on my counter was now on all of the desks. And I have a lot of cool stuff. And I was like, what is happening? And I went and talked to my administrator. And he's like, I don't know what happened. And I'm like, why is everything taken apart? And it was because during fall break, they put um, prote like protective film on the inside of my windows so a shooter won't be able to see me. Mm because my room's outside of the fence. This is the world I live in. The first poem that I wrote about that is called The Death of American Education it's on page 13. I'm gonna do that one now. All flags at all public schools in all of America should always be flown at half mast. Mourning the commonplace catastrophic shooting deaths average every, averaging every 77 days. Lamenting the fearful inside lives deliberately destroyed by bullies terrorizing both adults and adolescents. Sorrowing the martyr teachers as they suffer to their second jobs, exhausted just to make ends meet. Grieving every lost class classified as an art and thereby unworthy of the ignorant land's money. Despairing the children who weren't supposed to be left behind, but blend into the facelessness of impossibly filled classrooms. When did teaching and learning become a slow death? Knowledge's knife dulled by a lifetime of trying to cut through ridiculous regenerating red tape. Why am I still here? I thought I knew. Because these days, no matter my current level of dying, I can no longer believe that any of our heroic battling even matters, as the children I pledged allegiance to are used against me until I'm considerably less than half. Rope chafing, dying, dangling from the flagpole they've hung me from. All right, so I'm reading one more depressing school poem. It's going to segue into the uh, depressing Mormon stuff. <laughs> um, there is a battle going on in my school district right now. I work for Catalina Foothill School District, and there are some ignorant people challenging. I can't find this one. Um, challenging our right to take care of trans students. It's in the news, you can look it up. And last year was bad. This year's still bad, but last year was pretty bad. Um, they will, they, they, this group of parents and um, a particular church in town, not the Mormon church, but you know, Mormons are the nice ones. And so um, they would fill all of our school board seats and they would pick it on the outside and threaten people and we would have to have other placeholders and we would have to have um, security and we would have to cancel them because they were threatening. And um, I was teaching an AP class that explores current events pretty hard and um, one of my students one of my queer students brought, uh, said, Miss Hill, can I send you this link? And I said, yeah. And, and they sent me this link uh, to an article um, 
that is the Lion Foundation, or the Herzog Foundation, that directly connects itself to the Daily Caller, which is Tucker Carlson. And so um, they had interviewed some of these parents that don't want us to take care of trans kids. And so I'm taking information directly from that article. Just so happened to be Easter too, or near Easter. So the name of this poem on page 23 is, My Mother Wished Me Happy Easter with a quote about the resurrection. And this is the uh, excerpt from Arizona's high school policy tells girls to leave the locker room if uncomfortable with trans students. Jennifer Blank, a mother of four with one student at Blank High School told the DCNF the school is embracing a dangerous social contagion and discriminating against the truth. Jennifer Blank said she has compassion for children suffering from gender dysphoria, but argued that it was not going to help anyone to pretend it is normal. Blank said some parents have tried to ignore what was going on because it feels like a losing battle, but she said that the transgender ideology is a lie and will ultimately fail. One thing you do need to know is that my third child is trans as well. But right now in my classes, I have eight trans students out of 156. Three of them, I'm the only person they've told. Easter morning, I awoke to the buzz of my mother's happy Easter group text, complete with glittery Jesus gift and a quote from an old Mormon man on the victory of the resurrection, breaking the only two boundaries I've set with her. Seconds later, her second text arrived. She was excited for the Easter picnic. Lying in bed, I angry cried for the thousandth time, pondering on which side of empathy my mother and that picnic would be. The collective quilting group of Jennifer's bias bind their holy ideas into prairie points with razor blade edges. Hate made handicrafts cutting the rainbow to ribbons along with the loose knit identities braver kids than me dared recreate for themselves. Woebegone warriors, unstitching society's language surged seams, binding biology's double helix with spandex, boldly crafting their heart's translation. How is prying open the jaws of grammatic trappings dangerous social contagion? While you pour lies down willing throats, discriminating against the truth Jesus once taught, making the whole world go blind. The buttoned up tight white bishop gathers his harpy herd for the outdoor sermon in the pavilion filled with piles of fried chicken and vats of potato salad. The pressed congregation wilts in the heat as he spits scripture in a shower of sweat and bits of congealed egg. Wrapping hate warped words in candle wax paper like botched Pharisee leftovers. Victorious resurrection dictating the binaries of heaven and hell's eternal torture like this world's violence isn't enough. Meanwhile, the misbegotten children resurrect themselves beyond pronouns, rechristening their new names, walking the beach alone in their own transfiguration. You preach compassion for children suffering from gender dysphoria while spewing transgender ideology a lie is a lie. Must we pretend your hate is normal? The Daily Caller Caucasian Choir of Kate's, Tucker's, Neil's, Jennifer's, and Bart's sing their shrill song of finger-pointing shame. Hate-filled hallelujahs and hysterical hosannas drowning out the cries of lost lambs running from sheep-clothed wolves they thought followed Jesus. Shearing themselves of the pink and blue hair shirts forced upon them from birth. Newly naked gods remaking themselves in their image. The savage poetry of writing their own wrongness in spite of that pointed gun bringing glorious harmonic transformation. 
We, the teacher, mentor, foster, parent, ally, chorus of the world, reject your church of discord. You will ultimately fail in your pathetic antipathy. Love holds this, love holds this land. We burnt the corpse of your vampire god years ago. And no mother, I don't care about Easter. Um, how much time have I been reading? Are you keeping track? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I will. I this will. This is your book party. I know. Okay. Um, the, the poem that's after that one's called Sister Jennifer, and it's like from the perspective of a mother that's afraid of what's happening. And I wasn't quite that far into that mother, but I was a Mormon mom for a long time, right? So I understand, and I understand what it feels like to be afraid for your child. I'm not going to read that one, but that's just an explanation about it. Um, what I want to read is my Robertson poem, because this is a good one for the next uh, thing. So um, <laughs> when Pat Robertson died, um, I had a little bit of a, I don't know, I need the other poem though to do that. Hang on. Where's my phone? It's, I don't have my phone. Never mind. It's better with the other poem. Okay, so Pat Robertson died. And I'm like, okay, I kind of know who he is. But I didn't know a lot about him because he was not a preacher for me. Um, and so... It was just an interesting phenomenon, and I ran across a poem that someone else had written about him. And uh, there it is. Okay. Anyway, um, and I sent it to my uh, podcast friends that I do a movie podcast with, and. Uh, Kanan thought I had written it, and I'm like, no, I didn't write this, but I guess now I have to write a poem about him, <laughs> so I did. Um, this uh, poem that inspired the, my poem is, um, didn't have a title, and it didn't have an author. All it said, it was on, I found it on social media, and it said, Dana C. Dolan shared their friend's poem about the death of Pat Robertson. And so this was the poem that I read. I don't like to think about Pat Robertson going to hell. That lets him off too easy. I like to think about Pat Robertson finding himself in a heaven he never believed would exist. Where divine is reading in drag to the children murdered at Sandy Hook and Uvalde. Where Eddie Winston and Gertrude Stein drink coffee in the breakfast nook talking politics with Harvey Milk. Where Matthew Shepard relaxes by a stream reading poetry to a nameless young man whose family never claimed his body when he died of AIDS. Where the music plays loudly, welcoming dancers from the pults and club queue to the floor and where they twirl and vogue with all the murdered trans women of color whose names we never knew. Where Jesus puts his arm around Pat Robertson's shoulders and drapes them with a rainbow feather boa and gesturing around him says, come, meet my disciples. So that was like a delicious thing for me because it, it paired really well with, you know, criticizing um, Christian ideology that rejects queerness. And, and so then I really pondered, like, who was, who are my Pat Robertsons? And I had them. Um, I had a girlfriend in high school that I didn't know was my girlfriend because I never could say that. Uh, but I kissed her and I was obsessed with her and she manipulated me. So just like a lesbian relationship mm -hmm. in high school. So <laughs> my, my, my uh, first uh, relationship with a woman, she's like, oh yeah, you had, you had a lesbian relationship. But I just wasn't allowed to say that. There are rumors going around about me that I was a lesbian and that's that weird dichotomy of people knowing before you do, <laughs> which is fine. Okay, so this is called Robertson's Ruminations or rather When Death Wins. 
So, Pat Robertson is finally dead. And the decent, queer, loving, living people of the world cheer. Then, sobbing for themselves, remember how his words cut them a thousand times, and also how only the good die young. I think of all the other nasty, nearly petrified curmudgeons with loud, God-laced voices standing behind pulpits, spitting hate in the name of Jesus, the ones driving knives into the rainbowed breasts of Mormon children who dare to speak their own true names, so-called prophets telling the bleeding to set aside their sinful inclinations, deny themselves, and accept their lost exaltation, Old white men encasing queer love in the cement of wrongness, sending all of them to drown at the bottom of their self-righteous river while they stand on the bank smiling with empty platitudes of hating the sin and not the sinner. I remember the malicious Mormon men already dead as their words are quoted by those still here. And I shiver as the projected death toll rises with the prospect of Dallin homophobic oaks impending prophetdom of doom. His violent history of zealotry ringing in my ears, the electroshock therapy, experiments conducted secretly, the many gay students who took their own lives rather than live under oaks illegally surveilled condemning God's eye homophobic hate blaring from Moroni's golden trumpets atop temples no queer person can ever enter. The Lavender Scare epicenter was BYU, a university named for a man deep-seated in pedophilia and violence with a moral code strangled by the absence of Christ-like love. No, Pat Robertson was not my demon. Still, as death finally gleefully plucked him up, a prize nonetheless, I rejoiced with the rest. The list of those I wished were next, written before my burning eyes. You know, I'd like to fill up death's claw machine. He would win every time. Okay, um, it's a beginning. All right, so, um, I want to read. You know, one of my joyful pride poems. I, I read um, the Robertson poem and this other poem at a, a really amazing event at the MOCA um, that was run by um, the, the U of A LGBTQ Institute. And uh, it was just a, a glorious night of celebrating queerness. And I was really just privileged and honored to be a part of that. And so I read that, Robertson. I said, okay, so there's my queer joy and my queer rage. And um, the Robertson poem was my queer rage. But my queer joy poem is on page nine and it's called Pride Found. And um, I wrote this one pretty early on in my uh, year of 50 poems. It's like number seven or something. And uh, it just, was just beautifully perfect in a lot of ways, and um, it took second in the Pima um, Sanskrit concert con um, contest and stuff. So it's it's got some love, and I really like it. I'm gonna have a drink. Of them really quick. It's called Pride Found. So just keep in mind that I didn't really understand or embrace my queerness until I was 46 years old. And it's never too late to do that. And um, 
we all come to understand ourselves at different times. Uh, okay. Am I one of the letters because of my lovers? Or is something of the same and somewhat of the different? A by sides bleeding of colors from the all proud spectrum, lilac to indigo, purple muddled love. Because I like her red hair and his red beard, am I queerer than any other? I musingly wonder who doesn't like soft and scratchy ginger joy? Sorry, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a boy and they are them and she spins me round and round and inside I have found love to match my outside fire. Desire drawing all the magnificent mottled moths to a fierce heart flame that doesn't really need a label or a name. Just a letter or two that says, I want to be with you and with you too. Go through one more time and see if I like I need to read it. People that know me, if they have requests, I can do that. I've read a lot of them. Though. Gotta discover some of this on your own. Also. Um, the wheat poem is interesting. I'm not going to read it, but just as point of explanation, the poem they got it wrong in the end ends with "I'm sick of eating this fucking wheat," and that's because um, Mormons again doomsday preppers, and we have our own dry goods cannery, and you have um, one of the main staples is just wheat and gallon cans of gallon cans of ga. I still have gallon cans of wheat, and I have a wheat grinder. And I had a hand crank wheat grinder, and then mm -hmm. now I have an electric one, because why would you hand grind wheat unless it was the apocalypse? And so um, after I wrote the poem in class, they got it wrong in the end. Um, I was <laughs> challenged to write the wheat poem. And so that's the wheat poem, and it's just um, taken dr directly, parts of it taken directly from the um, Mormon pamphlet on how to preserve food and stuff. Yes. May I request um, and Vos Gazelle? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, anyway, and I I wrote the um, the first poem that I read you about um, the um, American apocalyptic genre, and then. Uh, um, our teacher ran into Sadie Jones um, that I had read and he, um, like his poem is about living in the apocalypse, so I wrote my own version. Okay, let's see. Not queer enough is a great poem, but it's also just about being queer. Then well, that'll be a good one to end on. Inheritance is about my mom, so. A Ghazal is a really hard poem to write. It's like a, a certain kind of foam, uh, form. Um, it's... People all call, call it a guzzle, but yeah, I really don't, guzzle. Play, don't like, like it's how it's that's upset. It upsets me. <laughs> right. um, I, I anyway, feel it's Middle, Middle Eastern. Am I, do I remember, did I remember mm -hmm, that yeah. right? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that'll be a good one to end. I don't think guzzles are really lapidary because what they do is they actually have specific lines and mm -hmm. phrases that move around and repeat. So for me, it's always like we're looking at something using the same language as if it has facets. And um, you're supposed to put your own name in the yeah. last line. And um, this is an excellent one. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and, you know, again, and the apocalyptic theme, which is, I think, all I started writing after I wrote that one for the class, but it's en moscas. Oh, I'm not good at it. All right. We have come this far, bleeding feet, standing at the gates, at the end of the world, burnt cataract waiting at these gates for the rest to arrive, dread hopeful. 
I haven't read this one out loud. I'm going to start again. It's hard because you, you're in the middle of sentences. So, okay. We have come this far, bleeding feet, standing at the gates at the end of the world, burnt, cataract, waiting at these gates for the rest to arrive, dread hopeful. Life's questions changed into survival soliloquies, leaving us pondering their surrogates. None of us know quite how we got here. Stray bullets bending our zigzag escape, racing, slogging terror that circumnavigates through global pestilent death. Clothed in rags, scavenged armor, melded piecemeal masks welded against slipping fears floodgates a baptismal deluge sure to drown everyone biting held in hollowness hands and roads empty ash bearing the hooked unpersoned toll gate Thank you for helping sew my books together. Thank you for bringing a book into my life. Thanks for seeing me and hearing me. Thank you. So, some insane amount of trans people commit suicide. I think it's 38%. That's what I've heard. I have two trans nieces whose mother is having a really hard time with this. Probably a little like Sister Jennifer. And I'm not sure if, the, if we didn't have educators like Ash, if they would actually still be living. Because their mother really wants to be supportive, but it's very, very upset. So, I just want to honor Ash in so many ways. I hope this is just the beginning of so many wonderful things for her writing and for her teaching. And the world is so much better with you in it. So thank you for letting me print your book. Please vote. <laughs> especially on the school ballots, if you have the opportunity, so we can support more educators who actually care. I believe both for, I was talking to Carol who helped, oh, Carol helped build this beautiful screen that we will reorganize so we have less of the wonder of experience. But, you know, uh, Carol and I were talking, and Carol, I was talking about politics, and what I said is for me, my greatest interest in politics, I didn't say this to her, but it's also my greatest interest in religion, is that I want both things to alleviate suffering. And I honestly think that, like, Ash is a Captain Marvel in this scenario. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, that's, it is the most best that you could be doing. Please love yourself for doing it. Thank you all for coming. If anyone wants to buy any of these things on here, they're all priced. I will have to have cash because I'm not actually selling any of these things. There are books for sale, yes. There are books for sale in the back, but I think I see everyone with one in their hands. I will be signing them back And, there, and okay. Ash will be signing them when she stops crying. Um, um, no, I'll cry while She'll just cry while she's signing them. I'm a pretty them. crier, it's Anyways, fine. Um, um, so, I want to add on this because you made me think of it. When Mary Rose says vote on the school ballot, you need to vote for school board members in your district and do the research yeah. because that is where these people are taking over. So there, yeah. I can't even vote in the district I teach in because, because I you live around there. the block. Yeah. And so please, but I vote in the TUSD school district and I make sure I know who they are. Yes. So do the research and that's might be the one of the most important things along with bodily autonomy that you can vote about and you have to do research about the school board 
It's very important. The reason it's important, I mean, and now I'm going to get it into my way leftist bent into politics, but there is a man named Steve Bannon who is the Rasputin of our time. Um, he was a person who supported Trump um, and really encouraged Trump to manipulate the American populace. But he is the person who is behind, he, the single person who is literally behind people taking over school boards, people taking over town boards. What he wants is he wants to have, he says, this is where you start. You start at your school board. You start as president of your PTA. You know, and these are folks who have really, you know, and unfortunately the ideology, they want to start there and end up presidents, which, which well, will hurt a lot of people. Sometimes I've thought, you know, school boards are just a throwaway vote. Not anymore. Nope. Every vote is important. Please vote with your hearts. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for supporting Sonorous Anchorite, the publisher of the book. And also, we run a movable beast every third Thursday, third Friday of the month. In my head, Thursday, Friday. Um, every third Friday of the month, although we won't have one in December, we will have one. November 17th. November 17th, which is what David is saying. Um, and we have actually, we, the thing about uh, movable beasts that's really important to know is that you can do just about anything. We have guitarists, we have artists, we have, what, we, what we're really interested in is having people come in and tell us what they're doing, whatever that might be. So please join us, please support the Spark Collective. Thank you all so much for coming. And no, 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 I'm doing the clapping. No, 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 no. Let's clap for Ash. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>